This protest march grew increasingly disorderly until it finally led to a confrontation between Chicago police and the protesters. About 100 demonstrators were arrested. The primary target was the American Medical Association, which is headquartered in Chicago. An AMA spokesman said it supported changes that would provide insurance for those now considered to be not insurable. was the day that gays literally kissed the Defense of Marriage Act goodbye. DOMA is gone. And they kissed it goodbye. Do you sense a change? All over TV. Based on the size of this ruling. As photographers jostled. Dude, come on, man. Just give me a shot. To record every peck, every public display of affection. Right now, they're holding a kiss out in front. It was equality versus the equation marriage equals one man plus one woman. But forget math. Reading was what reporters had to resort to. Shannon, I know you're reading as fast as you can. And the reporters were dependent on runners to get them the decisions. BuzzFeed labeled it the running of the interns. Here comes our intern now with the decision. Some ran triumphantly with arm upraised. Others opted for dignity, the stiff-legged walk. BuzzFeed gave the gold medal to this intern who arrived at his camera first. Apparently, he had lots of practice earlier in the week running other decisions. Reporters needed eyes in the back of their heads. With all of the energy and action behind you. First, we worried there was going to be too much action when we saw a guy stripping behind Joe Johns. It turns out he was only reversing his shirt. Soon, he was replaced by Mr. Sunglasses. A powerful electric moment. Who proceeded to stroll around, screen right to left, left to right, right up the middle on his cell, signing off with a thumbs up. And as you know, Ashley. There was an on-camera marriage proposal from one of the plaintiffs. And finally say, will you please marry me? <laughs> Another plaintiff in the DOMA suit was asked what her spouse, who had passed away, would say. You did it, honey. <laughs> and while MSNBC was interviewing these two plaintiffs live, to feel equal, a frantic gesture signaled a phone call. The president's on the line from Air Force One. President Obama. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Mr. President. This is Chris Perry. <laughs> and Sandy Steer, and we thank you so much for your support. And thank you for your leadership. You're invited to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> a gay wedding invite? What's next? If you haven't been to a gay bar, you're about to go to one. Ginimo, CNN. What did I think? I, I just, I started bawling. God bless America! New York. The history of gays and lesbians in America has been largely hidden. Love expressed in secret, lives too often lived in the shadows. For generations, to be gay meant being forsaken by family, fired by employers, even risking arrest or forced hospitalization. Gay life and gay love, however, found a way. 
In cities across the country, gay people created their own families of friends and lovers, their own society and culture, which thrived. The notion of equal rights for gays and lesbians, however, seemed like a dream. In 1965, a man named Frank Kameny, who had been fired from his government job because he was gay, along with fellow activist Jack Nichols, picketed the White House in the nation's first major public gay protest. But the obstacles ahead were clear. We discovered that Americans consider homosexuality more harmful to society than adultery, abortion, or prostitution. In 1969, another historic turning point. After decades of being targeted by police, some arrested for simply gathering together, patrons in a dingy bar called the Stonewall in New York's Greenwich Village fought back, and a new era of activism was born. With increased visibility came bitter pushback. A lifestyle that is both perverse and dangerous. Social conservatives who sought to ban gays and lesbians from working in schools found themselves doing battle with grassroots activists like Harvey Milk. There are 15 million lesbians and gay men waiting to hear your voice. And while some stigma slowly waned, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association announced being gay was not a mental disorder. Another battle was just beginning. In 1981, a mysterious disease began killing otherwise healthy gay men. This lethal epidemic sweeping out of control through the homosexual enclaves of America has been turned into a propaganda ploy, in our opinion, by homosexual sympathizers. Early on in the AIDS crisis, some religious leaders cast blame, and an action by public officials led gays and lesbians to try and care for each other. Groups like Gay Men's Health Crisis and ACT UP were formed to help the sick and push for better treatments. I started to look around uh, in desperation for uh, ways that I could uh, find treatments uh, to help save my life. Um, and there was nothing coming out of our government's efforts, uh, I quickly realized. More than 650,000 Americans have died of AIDS so far. The new medicines, which became available in the mid-90s, have turned HIV into a manageable condition. In 1994, hopes that a Democratic president might usher in a new wave of equal rights for gay and lesbian Americans were dashed when President Clinton signed Don't Ask, Don't Tell into law, preventing gays and lesbians from serving openly in the military. It wasn't until 2003 in the landmark Supreme Court case Lawrence v. Texas that laws criminalizing sex between gay people were ruled unconstitutional. And what was once considered an unthinkable goal, legalized same-sex marriage, began to seem at least possible. It happened first in Massachusetts in 2004. Here comes the bride, so gay with pride. Over the next 10 years, 36 states and the District of Columbia would eventually follow, despite years of political and legal challenges by equal rights opponents. In 2010, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was finally repealed by Congress, and in 2013, the Supreme Court in the United States v. Windsor threw out the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, granting federal recognition to married same-sex couples, but only if they lived in a state where it's legal. And that ruling set the stage for today's historic decision by the Supreme Court. What's remarkable is not the celebrations, the couples lining up on the courthouse steps in San Francisco, joyful hugs in New York City. We have to get married now. <laughs> or the tears of joy on the steps of the Supreme Court, where the plaintiffs in the case took a call from President Obama on live television. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, what's remarkable for those of us over 30 is the relative quiet among the opponents of same-sex marriage. For many supporters of same-sex marriage, today was a long time coming. But in the scope of history, America's had a remarkably short change of heart on this issue. The 1969 riot at the Stonewall Inn in New York's Greenwich Village was the first time the idea of gay rights percolated into the mainstream, though it certainly was not embraced. It wasn't until the 1990s that even discussing same-sex marriage began to pick up steam in the popular culture. Tonight at dinner, I'll tell my mother I'm gay. And on this, both supporters and opponents of gay and lesbian rights agree. 
the entertainment industry did a lot to change minds. It was through the medium of television that millions of Americans first had gays and lesbians in their living rooms. I can accept the fact that he's gay, but why does he have to slip a ring on this guy's fingers? The Golden Girls, launched in 1985, had a gay character in the first episode, and the topic was frequently discussed throughout the run of the series. Everyone wants someone to grow old with, and shouldn't everyone have that chance? Back then, 1985, 82% of the public opposed same-sex marriage. 11% supported it, according to a Los Angeles Times poll. I'm Pedro. Pedro, how you doing? In 1994, Pedro on the real world San Francisco introduced a gay man with HIV AIDS to millions of then teenagers. He died that year and was praised by President Clinton. Pedro became a member of all of our families. But despite his praise of Pedro, President Clinton soon signed the very same Defense of Marriage Act that was struck down today, the law declaring that as far as the federal government was concerned, marriage was between one man and one woman. Ellen DeGeneres came out in 1997, just one year later. You know, it must be very painful to feel like you don't fit in anywhere. You're starting to bum me out. <laughs> and these proclamations of normalcy about what was once called the love that dare not speak its name changed attitudes and prompted more real gays and lesbians to embrace their identities. In 2004, the year the Bush campaign used the issue to drum up opposition to Democrats, Will and Grace was nominated for nine Emmys, and same-sex marriage was declared legal in Massachusetts. Several other states followed in short order, and public opinion moved quickly, too. And while the Supreme Court does not always align with public opinion, Today's verdicts would seem to suggest the court is not immune to changing attitudes either. Sean, look, I had a debate Friday night on television with the pastor of the largest gay church in America, and he started talking about tolerance. So I said, well, how tolerant are you? Do you think those bakers in Oregon should have lost their business because they wouldn't bake a gay wedding cake? He wouldn't answer my question, Sean, three times because he thought they should lose their business. Well, let's and ask that's Brian. Tolerance. Brian, you want to answer that question? That's just where this is going. Brian, to answer that question. Well, I think that our country has a long history of in the public I don't want the history. Business. Answer well, no, the I'm, question. I'm, try, I'm trying to tell you because he's talking about why it is that, uh, that they should or shouldn't lose their business. And the fact is we don't deny uh, business to people based on their race. We don't deny it based on gender. A public business is open to So the answer public. is if they don't bake a, a gay wedding cake sexual because choice. of their religious views. Pastor, what's your reaction? Yeah, look, look, the First Amendment is not just for churches or synagogues. It's for all Americans to freely exercise their religious beliefs everywhere, not just in the church, synagogue or home. And that's why Justice Alito and Justice Roberts said this decision is going to be used to vilify those who believe in traditional marriage. And that's why I said, Sean, to my congregation yesterday, Louis Gomer was there. I said, we will not be silenced. We will not be right. intimidated by the liberal let me, left. Let me by ask Barack Obama or the Supreme Court. Let me ask Court. Brian a follow-up question then, because I think this is an important point. If people are practicing their deeply held religious faith and their faith tells them that this is the wrong lifestyle, obviously they disagree with you. Why not respect their right to, to live their faith? In other words, they go to church maybe on Sunday or maybe they have a Bible study on Tuesday night, but the idea is to live your faith 24 hours. If that is their deeply held religious faith, why not respect it and, and say, okay, be tolerant that they disagree with you? I think we do respect people's faith. But no, 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 and but I you just that, got to understand that, they've got to, yeah. you're going to force, use the force of government to make them bake that cake or no, shut I them think down. That we have, I think that we That's have right. a, a respect for people's faith in this country. I think we also have a, a respect for treating people equally under the law and the Constitution. So people and then so would have to, people who wait a minute, but then religious. people would have to bake the cake under, forced by the state to do so. They would have to bake a cake for somebody even if they disagreed with their race, with their religion. So they can't fully practice their religious their... belief, I think is what yeah, Dr. Sure, Jefferson Sean, is saying. We've, we've, said that, it. we've said that many times Brian, before. We've Sean, also said that Brian, folks have a father. Go ahead. I think one quick. way to look at this, and I, and I understand what, what's, what, what we're, mo where we're moving in society right now is to protect people of same-sex attraction as a separate class of people, right? How about this? How about if somebody comes to a 
a photography shop and says, you know what, I want you to take a picture of my first kiss between three people, three of us who are getting married. We think it's a wonderful thing, the three of us are in love, and we, you as a photographer, we want you to be the photographer. We want you to do beautiful art of the three of us doing our first kiss. All right, we're running out that's of time, Father. This is a long description. Going. And Sean, that's why... And that, I, I that's Sean, why Sean, you these, would these, not these make... Are, these Sean, are lots of different yeah, uh, uh, options and, and different uh, Sean, things that we could would talk to. Sean, you about. would not make a Muslim t-shirt owner, you would not make a Muslim t-shirt owner uh, of a t-shirt company, you would not make him uh, draw a picture, a cartoon that defamed right. the prophet Mohammed, we would not make somebody do that. Thank you all for being with us. Appreciate it. No matter which side of the gay marriage controversy you're on, there's no getting around the fact that this court decision is momentous. Brian Brown of the National Organization for Marriage warned of dire consequences. If you put into the law that it's uh, there's no difference between two men and two women or a man and a woman in marriage, uh, and that those that believe otherwise are the equivalent of bigots. Brown said there'd be more using the law to punish uh, individuals, churches, and organizations that continue to stand for the truth. This activist court, by redefining marriage, coming up with its own definition of marriage, something that's not included in the Constitution, will have a profound impact on religious liberty in this country. Ray Carey is a national gay leader who could help stop the targeting of Christian bakers, florists, wedding photographers, and such who don't want to service gay weddings. CBN News asked if she'd consider a ceasefire now. The answer was a pretty firm no. We will continue to do work in this country to make sure that everyone's right to their own personal beliefs are protected, but that people actually do get to celebrate, that they get to uh, choose who they want around them when they get married, that they get the cake they want, the flower they want. So religion should not be used uh, as, as a means to discriminate it against others. It should be our own personal beliefs. The couple had until Monday to pay a $135,000 fine for refusing to bake a cake for a gay wedding. That deadline's come and gone, and now the state is threatening to place a lien on their home until the fine is paid. Abigail Robertson spoke with a Christian couple who say their constitutional rights are at stake, and they're not backing down. The trouble for Aaron and Melissa Klein began two years ago when a woman came into their bakery asking for a wedding cake. Usual day. She came in, um, sat down, I had some cake for her to try. I asked her for the bride and groom's name. She told me it was gonna be two brides. At that point, I was apologetic. I said, I'm sorry, we can't do this. And I did not mean to waste your time. And she got up and walked out. Uh, that was the extent of the encounter. A few weeks later, the Kleins faced a civil complaint for failing to provide the couple equal service in a place of public accommodation a citation equal to a traffic violation in the state. We were uh, of the mindset that we were fully within our rights. I mean, everybody believes that that adage, you know, that we, we reserve the right to refuse business for, you know, any reason. The couple originally sought just $400, the price of one of Melissa's custom cakes. But Oregon Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian decided they deserved more awarding them $135,000 in emotional damages. He then ordered the Kleins to cease and desist from openly professing that they won't serve gay weddings because of their Christian beliefs. Since turning down the lesbian couple, the Kleins have had to close their business and have spent the past two years fighting to protect their religious liberty. And now they fight to protect their freedom of speech. It's First Amendment, free speech. You're looking at a government agency telling a private individual what they can and cannot say. This should scare every American. I'm shocked at the fact that I wasn't even, um, um, I wasn't even charged, like I wasn't even charged and I'm told, I, I'm being told that I have to be silent. And to me, that's like, I, I don't understand that. That doesn't, I mean, I don't see how somebody can tell me to be quiet. And frankly, I, 
I'm not going to be quiet about my faith. Hans von Spakovsky of the Heritage Foundation says the clients could seek legal action against Commissioner Avakian for his clear prejudices in their case. I actually think they have a potential civil rights case against Avakian. Uh, he clearly has acted in a biased, prejudiced manner. Um, he's acted as judge, jury, and executioner in this case. Um, and has acted punitively against them. Spakovsky also feels the ruling is intended to intimidate other Christians. I think the churches should be getting behind the clients, but I have no doubt that they're not saying anything about this because uh, the clear intent of the state of Oregon and Commissioner of Akian is to intimidate the Christian community. That's why he's imposed this huge punishment on the clients. And it's very clear that intimidation is working. Aaron and Melissa have seen mixed support from Christians in Portland. Even the churches, no, no, I'm not saying all of them, but a percentage of the churches said basically they've made this mess, they're on their own. Professor Michael Gurney from Portland's Multnomah University sees this mixed reaction as generational. I think for the younger generation, they don't understand why, uh, why Christians would refuse. Uh, for them, it's... It's not that they see this, they would see the act of baking a cake as endorsing. It's just, it's a matter of equality. I think we're going to see more and more uh, of this encroachment upon religious liberties. And I think that, that we, have to, we have to really um, be prepared for that. Despite the hardships and long road ahead, Aaron and Melissa remain confident God will see them through. For me, personally, it has been... I mean, it's weird to say, but an amazing experience. I've learned so much through all this. I, God has taught me to trust Him. Abigail Robertson, CBN News, Portland, Oregon.